And then he looked me up and down like this and said, um, and it's kind of only for really active people. <laughs> Excuse me? I felt my hand on my hip and my neck starting to do this. I've never been so close to jumping over an excursions counter in my life. It is Sunday, June 30th, 2024, and on this week's edition of Sunday Sofa Time, we're talking about five ways to ruin your first cruise. Happy Sunday, everyone. I know some of you are gonna be really confused right now. Not too long ago, I posted that this week's Sunday Sofa Time was gonna be a live stream, but I had to change the plans. So I got up early today. It is Sunday today while I'm filming this. The reason is I was supposed to have a tennis tournament this morning and then I would have time for the live stream this evening. However, it's raining. So the tournament has been pushed back until this evening where it's not supposed to be raining and I can't do a live stream from the tennis court. So here we are. I have now been on 30 cruises, I have made my share of mistakes and today I want to share with you what I think are five surefire ways to sort of ruin your first cruise if you're planning a cruise. I'm Morgan from the very unofficial travel guides. I've been making travel videos for over 15 years of popular and not so popular tourist destinations to give you a very honest unofficial look at what it's like to be there. And I do get comments on YouTube, on Facebook, on Instagram of people asking, hey Morgan, we love your videos. We're going to be going on our first cruise. Got any tips? for us and my answer to that is usually yes watch all my videos about cruising but to pick five of these tips the first one would have to be make sure you're picking the right cruise line Royal Caribbean, NCL, Holland America, Carnival, Margaritaville, Disney Cruise Line. There's a lot of different cruise lines and each line has its own kind of vibe, its target group, the demographic that it's sort of created for. And I think it's uh, it will really be doing yourself a favor if you do a little bit of research about which of these lines might fit for you and which of them is the best at offering what it is you're going to be doing while on the cruise. A perfect place to start doing this research is, as I said, YouTube, my channel, other people's channels. There are so many videos about cruise lines on the internet nowadays. I feel like there's almost no excuse to not be able to do a little bit of research about which cruise line is right for you. And I have a story about that. A couple years ago, some friends of mine wrote to me to say, oh, Morgan, you're gonna be so happy for us. We're going on our first cruise. These are people who are about 10 years younger than I am, very young at heart, very active, they like to be out and about. They like to have a drink in the evening. They like to go dancing. They like to do all these sort of young, young at heart, fun, and I'm gonna say party-like things. So when they told me they were going on their first cruise, I was like, oh my gosh, that's so exciting. Which cruise line? And they said, Holland America. Mm. Holland America is good at doing a lot of things, but catering to young and young at heart, very active people, it ain't one of them. Full disclosure, of all the popular mainstream cruise lines, Holland America is one that is still on my list to do. I have not cruised with Holland America yet, but I know from many of your experiences and also from their experience that the average age on Holland America is around retirement age. And that at about 9.30, 10 o'clock in the evening on Holland America ships, lights are out. On the flip side of that, if you are of retirement age, if you enjoy having peace and quiet while you're traveling, if you don't like to be bombarded with activities and loud music and bright colors, then probably don't book a cruise on Margaritaville for your first cruise. You might not want to go on a carnival ship for your first cruise. Just do a little bit of research to make sure you get on a ship that's right for you. All right, now let's talk about the traveling. If you're watching this from the United States, which I know many of you are, a large portion of the United States lives within a one day's drive of a cruise port. New Jersey, Florida, Texas, New Orleans, Los Angeles, Vancouver, there's a lot of options. But if you're somewhere where you are going to be required to fly to the cruise port, you absolutely should never, under any circumstances, 
fly to the cruise port on the day of the cruise. People, we all know how many times flights get canceled, things get delayed, the weather gets bad. If you're planning on flying from Milwaukee to Miami on the day of your cruise, that's like a perfect recipe for stress and disaster. I would always, always, always fly there the day before the cruise leaves and just spend the night in a hotel. It doesn't have to be a fancy, expensive hotel. If you fly to Miami, you definitely don't have to stay on Miami Beach. I'm definitely not a fan of Miami Beach anymore. But just give yourself the peace of mind and the relaxation of knowing that if there are some crazy weather things happening, if there are some flight complications, that you'll have more time to figure out a plan B, even if plan B is hopping in the car and driving down to Florida. At least you're not gonna miss your cruise. Let me know in the comments, have you ever missed your cruise because of travel complications while you were trying to get to the port? If you've read my book, Getting Stitches on a Cruise Ship, one of the stories in there is about how I missed my very first cruise a long time ago. If you like to read and want to give me a little extra support to make more videos here on YouTube, check out Getting Stitches on a Cruise Ship. It's available on Amazon now. There is another thing that you should do in advance before your cruise, and that is just a little bit of research and preparation. Listen. I understand just as much as anybody else that going on a cruise should feel like vacation, it should not be stressful, it should not feel like work, and that includes not necessarily having like a plan lined up for every day, leaving some time to explore and discover. I've talked about this in other videos. I really love having some unknown factor and going there and being surprised by something, maybe a, an area of the ship that I didn't know or something special in one of the ports that I just didn't have, you know, like all the information about. That's something I really enjoy is that feeling of discovery. And if you do too much research in advance, of course, that is not going to exist. However, it does pay to do a little bit of research about where you're going and what is going to be offered there. And I have some stories about that too. Not every cruise port is really where the cruise line says it's gonna be. In fact, I talked about this in last week's Sunday Sofa Time, that like when you are cruising the Mediterranean, the cruise port for Venice is called Ravenna, but they're not not close to each other. It's like an hour and a half drive. Rome is not close to Chivy Cherry Cola. Port Canaveral is not close to Orlando. So if your cruise is stopping at Port Canaveral and you're thinking, oh, well, let's just hop in a taxi and go to Disney World. Mm -hmm not necessarily the best way to do it. One of the longest cruises that I've done was a 14-day Mediterranean cruise that included going to the Holy Land as it was billed on the advertisement. We had two stops in Israel. And I was so surprised at how many people were in line for the excursions counter every morning trying to book an excursion for one of these places. And we overheard this family discussing possibilities while waiting for the elevator for our second stop in Israel, which was Ashdod. And Ashdod is the one that's closest to the cities of Jerusalem and Bethlehem. And I mean, how often in your life are you going to be close to Jerusalem and Bethlehem? But this family had done no research in advance, they hadn't booked any kind of tour or transportation, and they thought that they could just walk off the ship from Ashdod into the city of Jerusalem. Um, no. Not only is the cruise port surrounded by guards with machine guns, but Jerusalem is also about an hour drive from the cruise port. So this family, unlike the cultural cruise of a lifetime, we're thinking that the next day we were gonna sail into port and they were just gonna walk off the ship and I'm sure they were really disappointed because it's not possible there. I have another funny excursion story that I wanna tell you. This happened not too long ago since COVID. It was one of the first cruises that I did after cruising started up again, um, during or after COVID. I was on a German cruise line called Mindschiff and we were cruising around the Canary Islands. This was also something I booked very last minute and on the first day or maybe it was 
the second day. I went to the excursions counter because I wanted to book a bicycle tour. At this time, the only way to leave the ship was to be part of uh, an official ship sponsored excursion and they were all outdoor related things. We were on the beautiful island of Gomera and there were bicycle tours being offered but you couldn't book them in advance so I had to book it on the ship. So I go to the excursions counter, there's a young guy working there, he's probably, I don't know, like 21, 22 years old. I tell him I wanted to book a bicycle excursion, I couldn't do it in advance so I thought I'd ask, you know, what's available, what are the options? He said, well, we do have one spot left for our bicycle excursion on Gomera, but, and then he looked me up and down like this and said, um, it's kind of only for really active people. <laughs> Excuse me. I felt my hand on my hip and my neck starting to do this. I've never been so close to jumping over an excursions counter in my life. I told him, yeah, I'd like to book that spot, please. Spoiler alert, it turns out I should have listened to his advice because what he meant was, and I'm sure he could have explained this in a different way, what he meant was, this is a bicycle tour for people who are like, training for triathlon and stuff like that. It was hardcore, it was basically uphill for about two hours. The whole group had to wait for me, and not only me, there were a couple other stragglers in the group, but I couldn't make it to the end. <laughs> I eventually had to stop and tell them, you guys go ahead and when you come back down, I'll join the group again. So it was for really active people and I probably shouldn't have done it, but it makes a great story and it also made a great video. I'm gonna put the link in the description so you can check it out if you want to. Is it possible to go on a cruise and do no research in advance and book all your excursion once you're on the ship? Yes, it is possible. It could work out for you that way. I'm not gonna say that I haven't done it that way, but I do think, especially if you're not somebody who gets to travel or cruise very often, a little more preparation in advance will will help you solidify a good time, I think. But there's a flip side to that, and I'm gonna talk about that later. Right now, I'm gonna talk about motion sickness. So many first time cruisers, including myself before my first cruise, are worried about the motion of the ocean and if they're gonna get seasick. Yes, this is a real thing. This happens sometimes depending on the weather, depending on the wind, depending on the currents, the waves, the ships can be rocking and rolling. I've experienced some really awful seas, but I've experienced mostly not awful seas. I've been on over 30 cruises now, and from my experience cruising the Mediterranean, the Caribbean, the Baltic Sea, from New Jersey to Bermuda, I've done two transatlantics now, and what I can tell you is, most of the time, it's not crazy. And on my first, I'm gonna say four or five cruises, I was also so worried about getting seasick that I was taking motion sickness medication every morning, whether I needed it or not. And I'm gonna tell you something, even the non-drowsy formulas of this medication, they still make you drowsy. At least they make me feel stoned. And so my first four or five cruises, I was in like a fog for the entire time because I was, I'm gonna say, jacked up on this motion sickness medication that just sort of like, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. It's kind of like being high or drunk or something. It, it definitely affects the way you feel and the way you perceive things a little bit. It, it blocks, I don't know, some kind of sensory information, which is what it's supposed to do if you're feeling sick due to motion. But my suggestion would be definitely bring it with, but on your first cruise, I would say, wait and just see how you feel. My suggestion is to not automatically take it every day because ultimately I think you'll enjoy the cruise more if you don't need it and you go through the day without it running through your system and messing with your head. And honestly nowadays the motion sickness medication I feel like it works really quickly so if you are on your cruise and the ship does start moving and you do start to feel yucky, if you pop a pill you'll feel better soon. At least that's been my experience. And of course, there are extreme situations where the ocean is gonna be so crazy that 
even taking the medication is not going to help. But that is very, very rare. So don't worry about that too much. And speaking of worrying, my final thoughts are about your expectations. As with anything, a new job, a new school, a new car, anything that is new for you, the more expectations you build up for this experience, the higher the chances are that you're gonna be disappointed by something. So my advice is, be prepared for compromise and don't sweat the small stuff. Cruising is one of the least expensive ways to get a huge amount of fun and activities for your travel budget. Even on very low priced cruise lines like Margaritaville at sea, I think you can still expect a pretty high standard of food, entertainment, activities, and service. But even on the most expensive, luxurious cruise lines, things can always go wrong or even just differently than expected. And things happening differently than expected doesn't necessarily mean they're wrong. You know what I mean? Shows get canceled, restaurants have to close or there's no reservation times left. The weather can change so quickly. That's something you have no control over. If every time something happens differently than how you were expecting it to go is gonna lead you to have a hissy fit. Can we still say hissy fit? What's a different word for hissy fit? What I'm saying is there are definitely things that are worth getting upset about that are worth sort of escalating it to go to talk to guest relations to maybe speak to the service manager or the restaurant manager. I'm not saying there aren't things that are worth doing that, but there are also many things that can happen that are just it's not worth it. Would you rather have an extra hour at the pool or spend an hour waiting to talk to somebody at guest relations because the bartender only put two olives in your martini and you asked for three? I said earlier in the video that it's worth it to do a little bit of research, to look at where the ship is going, look at what activities are gonna be offered there, if there's something you wanna do, have it scheduled in advance to make sure that you can do some of these things. The more things that you have planned out in advance for each day, I kind of feel like that leads to higher chances of feeling like something goes wrong. Because if you have your day scheduled out that, you know, we're going to breakfast at 9.30 and then we're going to trivia at 10.30 and then we're going to this tour at 11.30 and then we're going to the sexy legs contest at noon. Ooh, sexy legs. If you do that much planning in advance, I feel like you're almost definitely setting yourself up for disappointment. You know what I mean? Be flexible. Be willing to accept that things are not all gonna go as expected and pick your battles. Decide which of these things is worth spending less time having more fun and more time being upset and complaining about it. As always, I'm interested to read what you have to say about this list. What are some things that have led to you having an awful cruise? Things that you maybe in hindsight thought, you know what, that was easily avoidable or I shouldn't have got so upset about that. Hit those comments, let me know. And in next week's travel vlog, I'll be showing you around our really beautiful cabin on the Royal Caribbean Brilliance of the Seas. So make sure you're subscribed and check back for that. I'm Morgan from the very unofficial travel guides. See you back here soon.